Good morning. Let's pray together. Holy God, may we enter into your mystery this day. May we feel your love and joyful presence, we pray. Amen. Well, if you can, if you're a picture person, I wonder if you could think for a moment of a group of adult friends, maybe three or four, sitting, sitting around a dinner table. They're eating, they're drinking, and they're having a wonderful time. The conversation among these friends has really taken flight. So they're telling stories, they're making jokes, there's hysterical laughter. Somebody's doing imitations that are amazing and wonderful as they often are. There's self-parody, there's irony, there's wit. Serious matters float in and out of the conversation, such as politics, sex, death and love. But nobody's really being all that serious. Nobody is preaching or trying to control the outcome of the conversation. Nobody's personality is dominating over the others. Everyone's individuality, if only for a short while, gives way to that greater pleasure. Indeed, the ecstasy of lively conversation with friends. And perhaps you know that experience very well, sitting up late at night and the hours pass among beloved friends. Now imagine at some point during the conversation, a six-year-old child wanders into the kitchen. They're standing at the corner just looking on and they're trying to get a sense of what is going on. Imagine this child, she feels that the room is full of joy and delight and communication, but she can't quite grasp what is going on in there. She can't form any definite idea of what is happening or what is being said. She does notice that nobody is telling anything to anyone, like what the weather is like outside. Nobody is doing an activity with a goal or an outcome like washing up or cleaning up the kitchen. And most intriguingly, even after she's been noticed in the corner, nobody is telling her anything or trying to get her to do anything like clean her room or go back to bed. There's all this commotion in the kitchen, a kind of explosion of excitement, but it doesn't seem to have any purpose. There's no why to any of it. And it might feel to that little girl either bewildering or alluring, or perhaps both at once. What I want to suggest this morning is that this is what our relationship to the Trinity is like. We're in the position of that little child in relation to the life of God, standing before or within a mystery that exceeds us, yet one that we are created to join. What the Gospel about Jesus tells us and shows us is that the life of God, the very being of God, is like an explosion of excitement and joy among friends who know each other very well and who love each other very much. So well and so much, in fact, that there could be nothing better than wasting time in each other's company. To speak of the Trinity is to say that God is relation. Relation so intense and so intimate that there isn't really any image or idea we can come up with that gives it justice. But when we say that God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that is what we're trying to say. Or when we say that God is Holy Mother, Krista, and Sophia in the feminine, like we sang earlier this morning, that's also what we're trying to say. Or when we use the language that God is Creator, Sustainer, and Redeemer, that is first and foremost what we are trying to say, that God is relation. Not that God is three human people or that there are three gods or that there are three parts of God, but that God is what happens between Jesus, the mystery he gives his life to, and the spirit of that giving. And what happens there is the joy and liberty that sets galaxies in motion and the love that death cannot defeat. The reading this morning from John's Gospel speaks of a liberty that was with God 
at the beginning of all things, a liberty through which God makes and sustains all things. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. Nicodemus, the man that appeared in that reading in John's Gospel, only appears in John's Gospel. And he was a very important member of the dominant Jewish religious group known as the Pharisees. He was a member of the legal body called the Sanhedrin, who were the judges and rulers over Israel. So he's a kind of judge. That Jesus is seen to so deeply challenge him is a purposeful stroke by John. It's a bit like me telling Ash Barty how to play tennis or how to tell Payne Haas how to run a ball. Now, Nicodemus is very, very wise then. So when he responds to Jesus, how can anyone be born, of, born after having grown old? Can anyone enter the womb a second time and be born again? He's not being literal. He knows that's also not what, not what Jesus really means. But what he is doing, and remember he's a religious leader, a judge, what he's looking for is something exact and precise. He wants Jesus to tell him exactly what it means and how it is to be born again. And yet Jesus does not give him a formula or a scientific explanation. He gives him a mystery, the joy and liberty of the Spirit. The wind blows where it chooses. And you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. I've often considered it very ironic that the story of Nicodemus approaching Jesus at night, it's dark, to talk about such mysteries is included in the very same chapter of Scripture as John 3, 16, a text taken up so frequently to create the bluntest, scientific-like formula of what it means to come into relationship with God. This idea that was only popularised in the last few centuries, that to be in relationship with God requires exact prayers and confessions, like a sinner's prayer, and then membership in exactly the right church. But Jesus says first, before John 3, 16, the spirit blows where it chooses. And you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. And there's a double irony. That's not the only one in this text being chosen for the lectionary on Trinity Sunday, which in the Christian calendar is the very week after Pentecost. Pentecost being this event that's so often reduced by Christian churches as solely being the birthday of the church, as if Pentecost is to be entirely understood about the Holy Spirit Spirit creating churches around the world. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. Throughout the centuries of the Christian church, many thinkers have taken this passage in John chapter 3 to hint at what we now call the doctrine of the Trinity. And here we are on Trinity Sunday. They've read this text in John 3 alongside the first chapter of John's Gospel, which speaks of the logos of the word being with God at the beginning and becoming flesh, which parallels the role of wisdom Sophia read for us from Proverbs chapter 8. And they read it alongside later ch verses in John's Gospel, particularly ch chapters 13 through to 17, where Jesus prays for the same spirit to make his followers one for that spirit to draw us into the very life of God, for us to enter into the life of God. What we are being shown here is not only that God's life is marked by relation, but also that this relationship of God to God mark, is marked by joy and delight and is the very liberty that underlies all things and into which all things may grow. Well beyond our formulas, an exact and precise accounting of things, and well beyond our churches even, to access the liberty of any created thing is to let it become a sacrament of pointless joy, of eternal relation. 
from all of us animals, human and non-human animals, all of the fields and mountains and the rivers of, and seas, from microorganisms to quarks, algae and iron, to think of the Trinity is to think of the relationship of us all, each and all a sacrament of pointless joy, of eternal relationship with God. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. So let me return to that six-year-old child standing in the kitchen, or perhaps even Tommy today. Children on their way to a mysterious adulthood, the way all of creation is on its way to sharing in the mysterious life of God. They may not understand now how a kind of pointless sitting around with friends is actually the best pleasure of all, and isn't it? The height of liberation, but hopefully someday soon they will. They'll catch on. The unconditional loving care and attention of parents and carers and other adults are these children's best clues to what await them as the possible liberty and joy of adulthood. Likewise, the way Jesus loves us unto death on Good Friday, the way the Father returns him to us on Easter Sunday, and the way the Spirit inflames us with this love on Pentecost are great clues to what eternal life of God is and what we have been created to share in as his friends. It is a life of unfathomable mystery, which is to say unimaginable intimacy Remember those friends. Unstoppable hospitality. The hours go on and on and you lose a sense of time. And unspeakable joy of the gift of sharing. And the community of the church is that place where so many of us in our own adulthood begin to catch on to. But the spirit blows where it chooses. And you hear the sound of it but you do not know where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. Amen.